Hello hackers! Welcome back to Pwn College. I'm Jan. Today we're going to be talking about races in memory as part of the race condition module of Pwn College. We previously covered races on the file system. Um, and of course a natural question it would be can there be races outside of the file system, right? So in other places. And of course the answer is yes. The file system is a very common place um, to uh, have race conditions because it's a shared resource between processes. But as we have now learned about threads, uh, we can realize, of course, that memory is a shared resource between threads. And obviously, since it's a shared resource that multiple different threads can use at the same time, if extreme care is not taken, race conditions will arise and do arise in memory. Let's take a look at this example. This is a very um, straightforward race condition. We have two threads in this process, the main thread and the allocator thread. Um, the main thread will loop and read a size variable, right? Just one byte. Um, and the um, allocator thread will loop and call read data. Of course, read data will check if the size variable that the main thread um, is responsible for reading. If size is less than 16, if size is less than 16, then we will read into a buffer on the stack of size 16, however many uh, bytes are indicated by size. Now, I wouldn't be showing this example if it wasn't vulnerable. Um, so of course it is vulnerable. It, this is in fact a time of check to time of use vulnerability, exactly in the style of a file system one, just in memory. Why? Because the main thread can update the size variable while between the time there, where bleh, between the time that the allocator thread checks it and uses it. Time of check, time of use, boom. Let's take a look at um, what happens here. All right, um, so I implemented this, of course, pthread race. Here it is, exactly what's on the slide. Uh, if we compile it, pthread race, pthread race dot C, link in pthread, boom. All right, and we run it. Oops, wrong one, apologies. It of course, it starts out with a, that size of 42. Um, it, that's, you know, just in the initial size right there. Um, all right, so let's see what happens if I hit enter. That's uh, an enter of course is hex 10. And so now it's asking me to send 10 uh, bytes. I re send 10 bytes and then it of course, keeps asking for 10 bytes. I can send more. Then it says invalid size 49. Eventually asked me 10 bytes again. Why did it ask me 10 bytes again? Because when I hit enter after all of these ones, I sent along another hex uh, A, another 10, a, a new line. All right, so uh, there's, there's some weirdness going on here. For one thing, um, it asked me to um, input 10 bytes, but actually put a, a bunch. So for each one of these, it should have read it in and said, oh, but this is um, an invalid size, but it only said it once. Why? Because of course, these threads are not synchronized in any way. So I, what probably happened or what certainly happened is, um, this check or this uh, read of the size variable happened many, many, many times uh, while this only happened to execute once. It's up to the kernel how to schedule different threads, not up to us. So um, that is what happens. Um, all right, so how do we exploit this? Well, uh, very easily, basically. We shove data at it until we trigger that time of check, time of use. Un Oops, I don't know what happened there. Um, until size is small 
smaller than 16 here and big bigger than 16 here and then of course it will read some giant number an easy way to do this is um just uh in a loop echo a zero one uh, uh a one byte and then an ff byte one two fifty six just in a loop okay this will just give us you know quite a lot of data random data but if you pipe this in to our pthread race boom goes a couple of times it said it it read the uh hex ff the 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 um uh invalid size of course it first read the one but uh in between it reading the one and the actual size check in the allocator thread actually happening uh it already went on to read this ff right and then it it went on until uh it, the one got uh read into size that passed the check uh let, let me bring up all right so what happened here um obviously we read in a size of 255 here and then this ran maybe this thread ran three times and the time it took this thread to run once that's very possible um through its loop uh it all depends on on the you know specifics of kernel scheduling um or maybe this thread kept running a lot and we just got uh just chanced that this thread ran while the size variable was 255 three times that's the likely scenario then eventually this thread um looped through the size check when the size was one and by the time it got to here the size was still one very possible um it only read one byte into the buffer and then eventually we got a valid size of one byte so this ran read a uh, size of one byte then this check passed it printed great job then this ran and read in 255 in in the main thread and in the allocator thread this guy ran and read in 255 bytes where it thought it was reading in one byte and of course we smashed the stack all right there's a very typical um data race in memory um caused it causes many many vulnerabilities um and it's actually very hard to deal with right this is a, a real deal vulnerability um, a special case of this vulnerability is that it can arise between the user land and the kernel obviously this makes it much much more um uh, impactful right remember the kernel function copy from user uh from the kernel module it takes uh input from the user and it copies it from user space it copies it into kernel space sometimes developers make mistakes that are basically time of check time of use vulnerabilities between the kernel and the user space look at this situation you have an ioctal handler that takes a, a user buffer a, a pointer to buffer in user space as the ioctal argument right um it calls check safety on the user buffer um, and says, hey, check to make sure that this user buffer, the, the size encoded in it is less than 16. To do that, it copies the size from the user and then it compares it against the maximum size and returns that, right? Of course, uh, I forgot to put an if statement there. Let me just one second. All right, that looks a little better. Um, so we do this safety check but then we grab the size again from user space right of course this is the time of check this is the time of use between the time of check and the time of use the value in user space can be changed uh, of course not by the um, thread that called uh, ioctal this is in an ioctal handler so the thread that called ioctal is suspended but it could have a sibling thread 
in that same process that has access to this memory space uh, in user space and could change that value between our time of check and our time of use between the first fetch from user space and the second fetch from user space. This is called a double fetch vulnerability. It runs rampant even today. Um, and it is a big problem um, because obviously if this size is suddenly increased, we can overflow this buffer in the kernel. And if you think that having an attacker control execution user space is bad, just wait until you see what happens in the kernel. And you will see what happens in the kernel in Toddler 2. All right. Um, other uh, data race concepts, right? Uh, data races can have really weird effects, even if um, they are not necessarily time of check, time of use, right? Um, look at this uh, situation, for example. You have two threads that each increment and then decrement a number. If the world made sense, you would expect this uh, num to always be zero by the time this line comes around because there's an increment, a decrement. And here we print it out only if it's not zero, you'd expect it never be printed out, right? But let me show you what in reality happens. So we have a uh, pthread clobber, same code as you saw on the slide num plus plus num minus minus and if num is not zero it prints it out i already compiled it so let's just run it and you can see num is one that's weird right but it kind of makes sense you might have a, a, a desync between those two threads but then it keeps going how can it possibly be five even if they desynced and uh one thread incremented as i was printing as the other thread i was printing it out that should be a one and then it would be decremented again. But now we're up to 15 over here. This is crazy, right? There, there, this shouldn't be possible, but it is. How is it possible? It is possible with this sample way of scheduling the instructions. And again, threads are scheduled non-deterministically unless you explicitly take over their scheduling. I'll talk about how in a second. But um, if we... Um, trace through this scheduling. You have the two threads. If um, for the increment, first thread one runs all the way through the increment. So reading the number, incrementing the number, uh, reading the, of course, the, the, the memory where num resides into a register, incrementing the register and writing it, it back out. Um, we end up with num being equal to one. Thread two runs, increments it, num equal to two. And now the decrement part is interleaved. And so they both read in two. They both decrement two. So they both end up with one. And then they both write back one instead of two. Because uh, basically this write of thread two clobbers the effect of this write of thread one. This is a data race. It's a general data race ending up in an incorrect value of number, right? The correct thing to do would be to have um, thread two read this after thread one wrote the result of its calculation. All right, um, as what happens here, right? So uh, data races are a problem. Um, how can we prevent the data race in that situation? Well. We can utilize what are called mutexes. They are um, locks between threads, um, and they're provided by the operating system uh, with a nice interface by libpthread. Um, there are also semaphores, uh, kind of an advanced type of mutex. Uh, this is all stuff that uh, is typically taught in an operating system course. Uh, we're just gonna very quickly touch on mutexes for the purpose of security. A mutex is basically a lock. Uh, and uh, only a single thread can claim the lock at a time. So when you do pthread mutex lock, you pass in that, that lock to the to libpthread, and it says, hey, is this available? If no one has currently locked it, it's mine. And then I'll keep executing. If someone has locked it, I'm going to wait for it to become available and then continue execution. What this does is, 
by putting p thread mutex lock between this code and p thread mutex lock after this code, it means that only one thread will be, ever be executing this code at a time, even though both threads have this as their thread main function, right? Uh, this is called a critical section, a section of kind of thread sensitive uh, or thread otherwise thread unsafe code that needs to be protected from uh, basically data races or, or, or other threading concurrency problems, right? Um, by using mutexes. Let's see how it works in practice. I, of course, copied that in here. Here's our lock. Here is our, uh, or that's the lock itself. This is us locking it. This is us unlocking it. Um, and I compile it. And if we just run it, it never prints anything. Why? Because nom is always zero. Um, cool. So we have fixed this data race through careful use of mutexes. Data races aren't something that just happens to you and, and, and you're hopeless. You can utilize uh, proper programming practices to prevent data races, actually similarly to um, preventing file system races. Um, all right. Uh, can we detect data races? Let's say we weren't so careful. We wrote a bunch of software and there are race conditions everywhere. Um, not really. This is a common theme. Um, there isn't a magic bullet for detecting data races. Some tools exist. So Valgrind, we saw Valgrind um, from memory conditions, uh, memory errors. We saw Valgrind um, through a lot, uh, several different um, types of vulnerabilities um, for heap problems and so forth. Uh, Valgrind also has tools to detect data races. There are two different tools that use different um, methodologies to do the same thing, uh, Hellgrind and DRD. Um, but Valgrind only works if you trigger the relevant code in your test cases in a way that it can identify that, hey, a data race could have happened here. Um, it's not a magic bullet. Academia, uh, the research community in general is working on magic bullets. Um, Dr. Checker is a, uh, a system that statically analyzes kernel code to identify uh, various vulnerabilities, including data races. Um, and then Razor and K-Race, um, they, they basically execute uh, kernel uh, code with random input to try to trigger uh, data races. Um, but nothing, none of these is uh, perfect, right? A good example that you know, this problem is still a problem is as recently as uh, I think uh, May, um, but, but this year, basically, there have been uh, double fetch bugs in the Linux kernel in an IOCTL handler, exactly in the style that I talked about just now. Um, so these bugs, uh, races in memory are a big deal. Um, and you will experience this, of course, in the practice problems. Good luck.